from my bowstring because I'm clumsy. <laughs> Is it about 4.30? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. On a button. Right on a button? One minute. Okay. If I talk like this, can you hear me okay? Yeah. And please feel free to uh, move in closer because you might want to take a closer look at something. You guys are okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are just fine. <laughs> my, name is, uh, my name is Joe Marshall. I lived in Wyoming once and I'm in the process of moving back here. I am a Suchanku Lakota. Um, I know that probably doesn't mean anything to you. It, it, my, the contemporary name for my tribe is Rosebud Sioux. I was born and raised on the Rosebud Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. What I'm about to talk to you about is Indian weaponry, and I learned about that from a couple of grandfathers. Uh, one of my grandfathers was a man who enjoyed making bows and arrows, and the only thing he enjoyed more was shooting them. And so that's why I got my interest in, in primitive Lakota archery. And I also developed an interest in kind of weaponry that my male ancestors used uh, to be hunters and, and, and to be fighting men. I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of weaponry that the Lakota mainly and some of the Cheyenne used during the Fort Field Kearney era. And, and we'll stick to that time frame. Uh, the weaponry was not as primitive as two or three or four generations before. By the Fort Field Kearney era, for example, with bows and arrows, stone arrowheads had gone up by the way of, of uh, a lot of other stone implements. Uh, iron arrowheads, for example, became prevalent about 1840. But during the Fort Field Kearney era, in this area, because of the uh, differences of opinion to put a mile over the Bozeman Trail or the Potter River Road, there were a lot of armed fighting men. And the number of those kinds of men range from a few hundred to a few thousand. Now, we don't know for sure. But given that at that point in time, the total population of the entire nation of the Dakota, Lakota, and the Nakota were about 20, was about 25,000. And roughly 10 to 15 percent of those, you figure, are men who are fighting age and physical ability to take to the field as warriors, you can figure out how many fighting men were available. And that kind of skewers the estimates of 5,000, 6,000 warriors uh, showing up for a battle. It just didn't happen. Maybe a few hundred. That's just food for thought. I'm not here to contend with the number of warriors, really. Um, by 18, the 1860s, uh, a lot of the Lakota had traded for various kinds of firearms. And the most prevalent kind, the most common kind, was the single-shot muzzleloader. This is an example of that kind of a weapon. And this is an example of the kind of decoration that was done to uh, weapons of this kind. All the, wep all the firearms that Indians had at that point here in this area did not look like this. There was no commissary that they went to and drew their weapons. They traded for them through so, uh, various calibers and various uh, brands. Uh, some of them were made in Kentucky, some of them elsewhere in the United States and eventually ended up here. Some of them were made primarily for trade with the Indians. And those trade rifles were not very good. So you can see someone probably had a vested interest in making a rifle that was not quite as good as they knew it was going to be fired back at them. <laughs> <laughs> but most of them up here had this basic appearance. Some were decorated, a lot of them, as a matter of fact, were decorated with brass buttons and so forth. This is a single shot. 54 caliber muzzle loader, and as you can see, the front sight has been sawed down. It's, it's a single action, you pull the bolt back or pull the hammer back, and squeeze the trigger. And that's how it works. Uh, I have a muzzle loader that I haven't shot yet, but people who have tell me that it takes a long time from one shot to the next to, to fire again, maybe 30, 35, 40 seconds, depending on how proficient you are. And Indian warriors, some of them were known to reload from the back of a galloping horse, pouring the powder in the palm of their hand over a lead ball, but guessing the amount of powder, guessing that the amount of powder was right. And if it wasn't enough, then of course the lead ball didn't fly very far. If it was too much, then it went too far, maybe even knocked the rider off his horse. That's been known to happen. But uh, there, are, there are paintings and stories of warriors spitting the lead balls down the barrel. Can't happen because the, the ball needs a patch 
to make it fit. And it has to be rammed down the barrel with this with this ramrod. So that's just a fanciful depiction of Indian warriors with their with their mouths up to the muzzle of the gun. You try it. Don't take my word for it, you try it. Because once with that patch, that mud, that lead ball fits snugly in here and has to be pounded down. So a lot of the weapons that were, were like this up until 1867 in the time of the wagon box fight when the army had uh, breech loading repeaters. But you probably heard some, of, some about that. <coughs> and along with the rifles, of course, the, the, it doubled as an axe, but it also was a very effective close-in hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon. You can imagine the kind of damage that this could do. <coughs> And, and it was used when two combatants were fighting each other from the back of a horse or from, from a, on foot. Not a pretty sight uh, to imagine what could be done with this weapon. This is a similar weapon. It's made out of brass. There's something slightly different about this one. If you look real close, you can see. There's a pipe bowl right here. You put tobacco in it, you light it, and you smoke it from this end. <laughs> So if you feel like being friendly, then you use this. <laughs> this side. If you don't feel like being too friendly, then you use this side. <laughs> now you've heard the expression, bury the hatchet. <laughs> well, this is a trade item. This was manufactured specifically for trade with the Indians. And traders in, on, along the East Coast and the Eastern Woodlands would, uh, to signify that they were there to trade, would bury the head of this hatchet in the ground, hatchet in the ground as a sign to the Indians that they were trading rather than fighting. So that's where that term came from, bury the hatchet. And you're all welcome to come afterwards up close and examine these if you, if you feel like. One of the other kinds of uh, primitive weapons is one that is, is doubles as a tool. It's a knife. This is a beaded knife case, which was the kind that was made in that era after glass beads came into this country. The knife was inserted in here as a trade knife. That, in that era, there were a lot of iron, iron bladed trade knives or, or knives that were made from uh, wagon wheel rims that were melted down or pounded down or piled down. And usually in the wintertime, they were worn outside of the belt, outside of the shirt, back here. In the summertime, they were worn under the, under the shirt or just around the waist. If you were a right handed person, then you wore it like this. If you were a left-handed person, then it was, of course, on this side, depending on what your, your preference was. Um, a tool for doing all kinds of things, skinning animals, cutting material, whatever. But it was also a very effective close-in hand-to-hand combat weapon. Now, what a lot of you all don't know is that in the old days, Indian boys were schooled to be hunters and warriors from the time of about age five. And their training was one-on-one. -on -one. Not the same person for all those years until they were about 18 or 19, but one person at a time, usually an uncle, a father, some, some kind of mentor who had a particular skill to pass on to a boy. One of the things that they learned was to fight hand to hand. And one of the weapons they learned to use was a knife. You've seen in the movies actors swinging this knife back and forth like that. Didn't happen. They fought like this. And the intent was to slice downward and <laughs> eviscerate your opponent. Just like that. There were a lot of movements involved with fighting with a knife. Yes, for those of you who are familiar with <coughs> judo or karate, there are a lot of similarities in some of those movements in learning how to fight with a knife. And, and young men learned to fight with either hand, sometimes with two knives in each hand. It was an art, and it's a lost art because not many people know about it. Lances, tossed lances, at, or tried to at the uh, at the soldiers. Now, first of all, the warriors did not get close enough to to throw far enough uh, to even reach where the soldiers were barricaded behind the wagon boxes. That's the first point argument against th those stories. The second argument is this is not a throwing weapon. This is a thrusting weapon. Again, meant for up close one-on-one -on -one combat where your opponent was on a horse or on foot or you faced somebody on a horse or you were facing somebody on, on foot from the back of a horse and again 
There was a whole series of movements that were taught involving the use of this as a combat weapon. A lot of those were steps to evade injury, moving around. And a lot of those were these kinds of things where you learn to thrust it. And the killing, the killing slice, so to speak, was an up thrust right across here. So this was, this was not a throwing weapon. In some cases, symbolically or to challenge somebody, they were, they were tossed into the ground. But you can imagine during a wagon box fight with the, with the uh, repeating rifles and the fact that the warriors who were there could not get close enough to even use this. This was not a fact. This kind of a weapon is not a fact. However, the lance was kind of like a, um, a symbol, uh, a, a good luck charm, if you will, a spiritual totem for some people. This is one kind of lance. This is another. As you can see, it's smaller, it's lighter in a hand, you can move it faster. But not all, uh, as you can probably have assumed, as you probably have assumed, not all the lances looked alike because they were all individually handcrafted. And there were no standard sizes. The, the, this is a war lance or a fighting lance, a, a combat weapon. The other one could be a hunting lance because it's a little bit longer. There were lances for, for hunting buffalo from the back of a horse. This is strictly a replica of a fighting lance, or a weapon to be used in combat because it's shorter, it's lighter, and it doesn't get tangled up so much from the back of a horse, and it's easier, and this is balanced. This is balanced, whereas the other one isn't. You can go up to a guy who has a six-shot repeater at 20 feet and think that I can take him out by throwing something like this at him. Just didn't try it. Well, my brothers in law might try it, but I... I <laughs> even after the acquisition of a firearm. No one knows for sure what, when this particular kind of a weapon was invented. It was invented here as it was invented throughout the world. And there are, throughout the world there are different styles. There are different materials that go into the construction of bows and arrows. And in this part of the country, bows and arrows are no less important than anywhere else, up to the point of the advent of the firearm, even a little while after. Uh, to jump ahead 10 years from the uh, from the Bozeman Trail era, and at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876, there were probably anywhere from 11 to 1,200 warriors. Again, that's that's arguable according to who you want to believe. Half of those warriors carried firearms, give or take a few. All of them, or about 90% of them, also carried a backup. And some of them, half of them, went into battle with only a bow and arrows. So even then, the bow and arrow was very, very critical, was very, very important. It was so important, in fact, that it was 12 to 13. 12 to 13? Yes. Sorry. I stand corrected. I stand corrected. In any case, when a child, male child, was about four or five years old, even before he was four or five, as a matter of fact, a toy bowl, like this kid, was hung in his cradle bowl. And as he was growing up, it was always there was a bowl and other kinds of weapons, uh, replicas, miniatures, in his proximity so he could reach and touch them and play with them and become familiar with the feel of them, but especially this particular weapon. Because this was the weapon that defined the hunter as well as the warrior. This was the weapon that enabled the hunter to provide for his family. This was the weapon that enabled the warrior, the same hunter as a fighting man, to protect and defend his family and his home and his community. That's all it is. It's a stick with a string. But it can do a lot of damage in the right hands. Not counting my brothers in law, of course. You have to understand that they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn from inside the barn. <laughs> this particular bowl is made out of Osage orange, which is not native to this country. Osage orange is probably the hardest wood in North America and it's found in Kansas, Oklahoma. 
It is very fine-grained, very hard, very flexible wood. Flexible is the key word here. Bows were made from hardwoods. All, just about any kind of hardwood uh, can be made into a bow. Up in this part of the country, it's ash, choke cherry, and oak. Those were the preferred woods in the ash, choke cherry, and oak. 